Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bill Maher. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Please, 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 no more. It will embolden our enemies if you applaud for me. Please, I know who won the election. I, uh... In fact, let's start off the right way tonight. Praise Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. Praise Jesus. <laughs> and welcome to an evening of faith-based humor and Christian conversation. But I am going to try not to be too angry tonight because, you know, I, I am angry about a lot of things. I'm sure you are, too. i tell you what I'm mostly pissed off about. I am mostly pissed off that not enough people are pissed off. <laughs> That's right? That's what I got. I'm, I'm not even that angry that the guy I voted for didn't win the election. I, I'm a little angry that I apparently was voting in a completely different election <laughs> than most of the country. <laughs> I thought we were having a rational discussion <laughs> about how best to protect ourselves in perilous times. And actually, it was a referendum on boys kissing. I, <laughs> I didn't know that. Nobody told me that. I tell you, when homophobia trumps terrorism as an issue, wow, this, this country needs to get laid. This, really. <laughs> but yeah, see, you know, this morals and values crowd that somehow has taken over, their issue would have a little more resonance with me if I thought that they even knew what morals and values are. I don't think they do. I'm not saying that as a put-down. I... But, you know, believing that the Earth is 5,000 years old and was created in six days, that's, that's not really a moral or a value. It's just stupid. You know, it's... What, what, what they're talking about are rituals, superstitions, traditions, personality cults. You know, I was taught morals and values were choices we made about how we treat other people. Fairness, kindness, tolerance, generosity, honesty, courage. Those are actual morals and values. And by the way, they can be actually measured. You can measure what you value. For example, we found out just last week that airport security in this country, three and a half years after 9-11, still sucks. <laughs> so obviously we don't value that. That's just human life. It's not like we can't do security well. Have you ever been to a casino? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't do math in your head without being spotted, videotaped, <laughs> tussled off the floor and buried in the desert by Joe Pesci. Banks somehow can get math down to the number. Voting machines, not so much. You know, whenever there's a recount, they say, well, come on, it's only democracy, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Ballpark figure is the best we could do. You know, the bank never says, it's about $10,000. If it's a little more, good for you. We don't really care. That's not the kind of people we are caring about money. Oh, no, we don't care about money. <laughs> So, you know, being against gay marriage, I don't know why that's a moral or a value. It's just really another bullshit issue that the Bush family used to win an election because they are the champions of bullshit issues. The Pledge of Allegiance, Willie Horton, burning the flag, bringing honor and integrity back to the White House. Talk about being pulled over by the weight of your own balls. 
And I'm sure whatever Bush runs the next time, Jeb or Jenna, whoever it is, <laughs> I'm sure Karl Rove will come up with another complete stupid bullshit issue. You know, no sex on Christmas. You can't fuck on Jesus' birthday. My opponent wants people to fuck on Jesus' birthday. You know, some issue like that. Let's put the fetus on the one dollar bill. <laughs> The fetus on the one with Reagan. Reagan and the fetus on the one dollar bill. My opponent is against, you know. Why, poor Ronald Reagan, the liberal media only gave him a two week funeral. Did you see that shit? It wasn't until the fourth or fifth day I said to myself, no, I really think he is dead. I do. I, <laughs> I wasn't buying it up till now. Oh, God bless him. He, he ruined it for everybody because, you know, he was a naturally sunny candidate. Now all the candidates want to be that, and of course they're not. So we have this childish fight every election cycle about who's more optimistic. <laughs> what about more realistic? Is there any other country in the world that needs this much sunshine blown up its ass? You know, the politicians aren't any prize, but the voters are such pussies. They really are. Right up until the end, I heard, I heard people saying, I don't know if I'm comfortable with John Kerry. Who gives a shit if you're comfortable, you stupid schoolgirl? You don't have to fuck them, just vote for them. Comfortable. You have to be comfortable every second of the day. <laughs> comfortable. I don't know if John Kerry's a man of the people. Good. <laughs> I can't think of a higher qualification for someone than not being a man of the people. Man of the people. You know, it's very hard to combine an intellect with a man of the people. Usually you get one of each, you know. The last guy who truly combined them both, Bill Clinton, was an intellect and he was truly a man of the people. He fucked ugly girls. That is a man. <laughs> that is a that is a man of the people, okay? No, no, nothing endears you more. This is the guy who struck out with Paula Jones, okay? That that is <laughs> that is a man of the people. See that's I guess that's what I don't get about America. The priorities. You know, that's where I just don't fit in. I don't understand our priorities. I don't get it that people get so worked up about gay weddings or, or whether Janet Jackson's tit fell out of her bra for one second. I mean, and Petula Clark kissed a Negro. Did you hear? <laughs> what country is this? What year are we in? Janet Jackson's milkshake was on television for one second and America was permanently traumatized. I, I tell you, when that shit was going down, I was telling people, I'm Swiss, really. I, I, <laughs> no, I, I live here now, but I, I'm actually a Swiss national. And I know the right wing hears that and they go, there you go, Bill Maher, hating America first. Part, you know what? I don't hate America first. First, I have my coffee. Then I hate, no. <laughs> no. No, I don't hate America. I love America. I love America. And what I would say to my right wing friends is that I don't hate America. I'm embarrassed, okay? I'm embarrassed. Like, from shit like this. I'm embarrassed that America has been taken over by cretins like you who I have to now be represented by. There's a difference between hating it and being embarrassed by it. I mean, if you, if you hadn't seen the Janet Jackson episode, you know, because you sneezed, <laughs> and you had just seen the reaction, you would have thought <laughs> that Justin Timberlake took out his dick, <laughs> stripped her naked, and did her over the back of a chair, Kobe style. 
Then, the reaction <laughs> would have fit what happened. Then I would have said, okay, they're right, that is too far. <laughs> no, no, that, not after Aerosmith. I mean, come on, people. You know, because that's what people said. It was like, yeah, but it happened at the Super Bowl. <gasps> oh. <laughs> right, I forgot it happened at church. <laughs> Last year, Linda Ronstadt was performing in Las Vegas. You saw this at the Aladdin Hotel, and she dedicated a song to Michael Moore. Half the audience, the conservatives, stormed out. They tipped over the tables, they threw drinks. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they got less worked up when the lion ate Roy. You know, why do we always have to be the stupid country? Yeah, you know, why, why can't we be a hip country for once? Why can't we be one of those countries where the, the president has a permanent tan and expensive suits and a Versace mistress? And there's pictures of them fucking on a boat, but nobody cares because that's amore. You know, why, why can't we be that country? Why, <laughs> why do we have to be the country with the midget dating shows? I tell you, when you go to the midgets, that is the end of the empire. I, I, I studied old Rome in college. All the pictures are <laughs> midgets chasing big-breasted women. I, or as we now call it, the Fox Network. Oh, I, I can't, please. But I'll tell you something, Re reality television, that, that was not a good thing for us. It, it, no, it was not good for us to see us. Because we're not that good. <laughs> no, seriously, reality television is not good, clean fun. It's cruelty and people enjoying cruelty. Every show, <laughs> right? I mean, it's ostracism. It reminds me of grade school. Every show is, you're off the island. Your singing sucks. <laughs> You're not hot enough. You know, sometimes the politicians say, you know, if we only had a government as good as the people. Really? <laughs> Which people? These assholes? Because these people are not good. And it's funny, sometimes I watch the news at night and it's always Iraq, the lead story, and you see these young soldiers over there, and no matter what you think about how we got there, you gotta give it up to these kids who, they're there, the mission. <laughs> the mission itself is hard enough, but then there's all sorts of backdoor drafts where they extend their tours calling up the guard, the reserve, all these Enron accounting tricks. So Rumsfeld doesn't have to admit he got the troop levels wrong. And still they don't bug out and I see this. And then I watch some reality show and I see people who are peevish and selfish and greedy and narcissistic and lazy and stupid. And I think to myself, why is this first group of people defending this second group of people? <laughs> I, I really would like an answer to that. You know, if he had just kept it real about Iraq, George Bush, I, you know, he'd have had me at hello. He really would. If instead of trying to scare us that Saddam Hussein has a death ray, you know. If he had just come out there and said, look, it's a Texas thing. You know. They tried to kill my daddy. <laughs> and I will never be able to sit down with my family again in peace until I have Saddam Hussein's head on a stick in the middle of Baghdad. Or as it's now known, the Galleria at Halliburton Square. <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good. That's why I came here. <laughs> How about this? for a new rule. New rule, people from Texas can't be president. How about that? Wouldn't that solve a lot? And
And again, I'm not saying that as a partisan political st I'm not. I'll prove it to you. I said I'd prove it. Because I'm also talking about Lyndon B. Johnson was for Texas, was a Democrat, got us into Vietnam. People from Texas just think differently, okay? They wanted to be their own country, and perhaps they should have been. They're cowboys. And by the way, speaking of cowboys, what is with Bush wearing the cowboy hat and the cowboy boots and the cowboy belt? Memo, um, <laughs> there are no more cowboys, which means you're wearing a costume. Okay. <laughs> you might as well be dressed as Sherlock Holmes or a pirate. The president wears a costume. Just, if you're okay with that, I'm okay, okay but you know. But I am not one of those people who says that Iraq is Vietnam. Uh, first of all, in Vietnam, Bush had an exit strategy. Uh, uh, <laughs> and again, I'll prove it to you again that I am not being partisan when I say that because when Bill Clinton ran for president and people accused him of being a draft dodger, I never defended that. I love Bill Clinton, but I love the truth more. Yes, he was a draft dodger because you know what? When there's a war on, you either go or you find a way not to go. Bill Clinton found a way not to go. Draft Dodger, same as George Bush, a draft Dodger. His flashbacks are of blackouts. And then he tries to weasel his way out of it with his morphing act. You know, he is the morph master. You know, he morphed monogamy into integrity. He morphed bin Laden into Hussein. And he tried to morph his National Guard service in 1968 with the National Guard service of today. You know, yeah, back then it was a way to get out. Now it's a way to get in. That's a dirty trick we play on those guys. They think they're signing up for paintball on the weekends. And they wind up in Fallujah. But... <laughs> Don't denigrate the guard. We weren't. We were denigrating you. <laughs> Gets all huffy about it like he's Jack Nicholson and a few good men, you know. <laughs> Have you ever served in an extreme rear area? <laughs> I get my teeth cleaned 6,000 miles away from people who want me dead. You want the truth? I can't remember the truth. <laughs> and I, you know, th this draft dodger stuff, I bring it up because it is relevant. It's relevant because if George Bush had gone overseas, like so many brave young Americans do, he would have come to understand what all of them understand, which is that people who are not like us are really not like us, okay? Every time Bush talks about they hate us for our freedom, I just want to slap him in his two-dimensional mind, okay? They hate us for our freedom. They hate us for our freedom. You ought to get a fucking parrot. They hate us for our freedom. They hate us for our freedom. <laughs> you tell them, Fluffy. They hate us for our freedom. That's right. And that's the problem, I have to say, with this president, is that he's very, what they call, ethnocentric. You know, he only sees the world through his eyes, through the eyes of, of his culture. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, after uh, bin Laden slipped through our dead or alive dragnet, <laughs> in 2001, we put out a bounty on his head of $25 million. And after three years, when we still didn't find him, they upped the bounty to $50 million. Because that was the problem. <laughs> yeah, to, to, the, <laughs> to the goat herders on the Afghan-Pakistani border who live on a dollar a day. <laughs> $25 million was, quite frankly, insulting. Just, it was, 
as an author, it was just insulting. It, <laughs> Who do you think you're negotiating with, my friend? I don't milk a yak for $25 million. I, I don't get out of bed for... And what can I tell you? Freedom means different things to different people. The Koran says freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> now that's me and Bobby McGee. I'm sorry. I, I, I mix those two up all the time. As for now, you know, did it make us safer? No. Not in our lifetimes. I don't care how good that comes out. In our lifetime, it's not going to be safer. Those pictures alone from Abu Ghraib ass prison <laughs> ensure that you and I are not going to be safer in our lifetime because that was the Muslims' worst nightmare, that we would invade an Arab country and then there would be pictures of our hillbilly women folk pointing at their wieners. <laughs> that is like their ultimate... I mean, did you see these pictures? This picture after picture of piles of hairy man ass. <laughs> Does the media have such sphincteritis about the military that they can't even point out how overwhelmingly gay this is? When every picture is, hey, get one of me with all the penises in my face. <laughs> it's like the worst newlywed game ever. <laughs> Where's the weirdest place you ever made whoopee? On a pile of naked Iraqis, actually. I mean, come on. I don't think Rumsfeld should step down. I think he should come out. <laughs> yeah, I guess what's most confusing about Iraq is people think of the Republicans as, if nothing else, efficient. So how could they do this war in such a bad way? This was supposed to be the efficient people. This was the CEO administration, right? That's what they ran on. The Clinton White House was a dorm room. People were late to meetings and there were pizza boxes everywhere and people getting blowjobs. I mean, it was a disgrace. And these people came in, they were going to wear a coat and tie, and they were on time to meetings. So how come this is the crowd that fights a three-week war and then goes, Ooh, dude. I totally spaced on the post-war. <laughs> Whoa, shit, I, I had a little sticky on my computer. It said post-war. It must have fell off. <laughs> And it is a, a good question, and I'll, I'll give you my theory on it. I think what it is is that Republicans, for all their macho posturing, they're really such sentimentalists. You know, everything is that lump in the throat moment. Bush with his arm around the fireman. Oh. <laughs> Reagan, it's morning in America. Yeah, I used to think, yeah, but I'm not a morning person. <laughs> So that's why they didn't have a plan, you know? Why didn't they have a plan? Because they didn't think they needed a plan. They just thought, we're going to go over there and we're Americans. We're spreading freedom. We're going to spread freedom dust. You know? Who needs a plan? It was Operation Get a Load of Us. So, you know, even if they did wind up getting the big picture right, and that still is something of an if, you know, just the way they fucked it up all along the way, the amount of people who had to die needlessly, the bad judgments. And then during the campaign, Dick Cheney had the nerve to make John Kerry's judgment the issue. That's what he kept saying. Can't trust wild man Kerry's judgment. And I thought, oh, good. Let's have an election based on judgment about national security issues. How about the judgment to piss off the whole world so that we had exactly one real ally for Iraq II, the search for Curly's gold? How, how about the judgment <laughs> to ignore briefings and memos with titles like Osama bin Laden is standing right behind you. <laughs> I 
How about the judgment not to hold anybody accountable for these massive intelligence failures? He realized that since 9-11, the only person to have been held accountable and fired because of this is me. <laughs> How about the judgment on 9-11 to keep reading to school children? when you are told the country is under attack. I mean, talk about being nonpartisan. How much of a partisan pretzel do you have to twist yourself into to work backwards to, yes, when, some, when a president is told that the country is under attack, the proper thing to do is to freeze, to choke, to sit there like Forrest Gump. Really, that takes a lot of working backwards to that. Because you know, it's not like we live in the nuclear age. Oh wait, we do live in the nuclear age. In fact, Bush and his buddy, Mr. Blair, sold this war partly by telling us that Saddam Hussein could reach us with his nuclear weapons, which he didn't have, in 45 minutes, 45 minutes but seven to sit there while your piss dries, that's okay. <laughs> you know, seven minutes is a long time in the nuclear age. This is not 1780. Sir, the British fleet has left Portsmouth. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, get moving, even that guy would have gotten up, you know. They'll be here in three months. Three months? Well, what the fuck are you standing around for? I mean, seriously, seven minutes. <laughs> seven minutes is a long time. Layla is seven minutes long. Just, <laughs> even with the end part, with the guitar solo and the Dwayne Allman and the birds chirping. <laughs> so, I, you know, I know Republicans pride themselves on being loyal, and they are, but loyal to what? To a person or to a principle? Because if you defend a president for sitting there for even one second after he's told America is under attack, you are loyal to a person more than you are to the truth, to a principle, or to your country. You know, <laughs> if you defend that, you have drunk the Kool-Aid. You are part of a cult. Because any president of any party would have gotten up. Democrat, Republican, Whig, doesn't matter. <laughs> president Van Buren, America's under attack, would have gotten up. President Reagan, America's under attack, would have gotten up. FDR would have gotten up. He couldn't even get up. <laughs> Did he think he was being punked? I, I just, I can't. Just out of curiosity, you know, I would think just curiosity would make a person get up when someone comes in and says, America's under attack. Ooh. You mean North America? By who? Nuclear attack, conventional, I've got to know. I'm just nosy that way. <laughs> Are our fighters scrambled? I'm just nosy. Oh my God. So when you talk about Homeland Security, I, I would think it would start with how a president re reacts to the country being under attack. But then again, so much of our Homeland Security is purely symbolic. <laughs> Put Tommy Chong in jail last year. Did you see that? For selling bongs on the internet. I feel safer. I don't know about you. But a couple of years ago, they busted Bob Denver. 
TV's Gilligan. So we got Chong, we got Gilligan. That is two thirds of the axis of Coolio right there. And <laughs> even if it just took two agents to bring down Tommy Chong, he is in his 60s now. You know, couldn't they have better been spent just taking those two agents and putting them in a room with nothing and just saying, think about Al Qaeda? I mean, wouldn't that uh, take one of Tommy's bongs <laughs> and really think about Al Qaeda? Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I don't know how marijuana, the, the one drug that never killed anybody, got to be the demon seed. It's just amazing. It's such a triumph of negative marketing. And it's funny because the far right, the Christian right, they're the ones who are usually so against drug use of any kind. And it's very hard for me to picture Jesus Christ walking up to a medical marijuana patient and going, up, 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 let me take that, my friend. <laughs> that's a slippery slope right there. I'm sorry, that's, that's a very bad message to kids. Now, good luck with your bone marrow cancer. Because, <laughs> you know, it's always a slippery slope to kids. That's, you can get them, you always get the voter on that one, you know? It doesn't seem like an adult twisting up a fatty to watch Nick at Night is, doing any harm, but that's a slippery slope to your kids blowing people behind dumpsters to make money for their heroin habit. My opponent wants your children blowing people. It's a slippery slope right to that. And look, I don't, I don't want to hurt children. I'd like to protect children too, but is everything worth sacrificing to that? I mean, drugs have done a lot of good. You know, they, really, I mean, they, they've midwived a lot of good ideas, a lot of great songs, you know? <laughs> I, I think Penny Lane is worth 10 dead kids. I do, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> I do, I do. I think Dark Side of the Moon is worth 100 dead kids. There, I said it, okay? <laughs> I guess what's so uh, frustrating about the drug movement is that it's not much of a movement. That's too many stoners involved, but uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, that is one problem. But also just the, the inconsistency, the fact that somebody like Rush Limbaugh, who has made a career preaching that anybody who does drugs has got to go right to jail, do not pass go, no questions asked, right to jail, gets caught doing 30 OxyContin a day. 30 OxyContin? Do you have any idea how high that is? I don't, and I've been pretty high. But, <laughs> wow. 30 OxyContin. This guy is putting up Elvis numbers, ladies and gentlemen. But how does he get away with it? They say, well, he's on medication. Oh, see, that's not drugs. Oh, no, that's medication. Well, you know what, pal? We all got our medication, don't we? They can have an ad on TV that said, ask your doctor if Jack Daniels is right for you. <laughs> and it would not be out of place thematically. And I guess if I have any theme here tonight, it would be that this is just legislating taste, and there's nothing that bothers me more than that, and it's what we do all the time in this country. We legislate taste. There is nothing about preferring the high of OxyContin that makes you morally superior to someone who prefers the high of pot or mushrooms or crack. I mean, this guy... This guy was so on the pipe, he was making his maid score his drugs for him. How's that for morals and values? You gotta say that about the Republicans. They are kind of hard on the help. <laughs> Rush Limbaugh with the maid, Strom Thurmond 
with the maid. You saw that story? Oh, my. I love this woman. Essie Mae Williams, Strom Thurmond's illegitimate daughter, 78 years old, came forward last year, waited until he died. She didn't want to wreck his career. Wow, girls love their fathers, huh? <laughs> didn't want to wreck his career, so she waited for the old prick to die which took a hundred years. <laughs> Talk about waiting to exhale. <laughs> and of course it was true, nobody even contested it. She was the illegitimate half-black daughter of Strom Thurmond. He was her father, and get this, her mother <clears throat> was the black maid working in the Strom Thurmond household. In 1925, Jim Crow, South Carolina, and the media refers to this as an affair. <laughs> an affair, a delightful sort of upstairs, downstairs romp. <laughs> With stolen glances across the dinner table and Tony Randall as the best friend. <laughs> Rape would be the word I would use to describe a situation where one person cannot say no. That would be called rape. Thank you. <laughs> calling this an affair is like calling pedophilia a lifestyle choice. But you know, black folks did get a little payback recently. Uh, the FBI reported that uh, there was a new class of prostitutes in America, and they are teenage suburban white girls. I love this. <laughs> I do. Teenage, suburban, middle-class white girls are selling their asses at the mall to make money to buy things at the mall. It is adorable. <laughs> Little Ashley is selling her coochie for Gucci. It is adorable. And... <laughs> people out there are saying, well, that he's talking about somebody else. No, it's you. <laughs> Your daughter's a whore. <laughs> I just like saying that. But, um, but people want to know, how, how did this happen? Well, I'll tell you how. It was kind of a fitting joke on white people because after World War II, there was something called white flight. White people got out of the inner city. They did not want to be around the black culture because they thought if their kids grew up around black people, well, the boys would want to be pimps and the girls would want to be whores. And now, through the miracle of MTV, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. <laughs> And, you know, when I was a kid, my father hated rock and roll, but if you printed out the lyrics to rock and roll songs, he could understand them, and they weren't very threatening. That's not true with rock, with hip-hop and, and rap music. I mean, first of all, it's written in a language your child understands, a bonics, but you do not. <laughs> Therefore, as a public service, I have translated into white a number of <laughs> rap lyrics that... I would like to read for you now, um, because I'm telling you, you don't understand what these words are, and I'm not going to read the rap lyrics themselves, because I'm telling you, you just wouldn't understand them, but I promise these are faithful renditions into white. <laughs> A little something I like to call Master P's Theater. <laughs> Our first selection is from the Notorious B.I.G. with lyrics by Mr. R. Kelly. The selection is entitled, I'm Fucking You Tonight. That is the actual title, I promise. And here is the translation. This evening we won't be dining, we'll just be having intercourse. You'll surely appreciate my stamina and the fact that I own a late model European sports sedan. <laughs> if you shifted position, you would have a better view of our intercourse. I appreciate it when we have intercourse with increased vigor and velocity. This evening we won't be dining, we'll just be having intercourse. All right, that's Mr. How? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> 
Thank you. Theater is my first love, and the classics. They don't write them like that anymore, do they? All right, our next selection from Mr. Snoop Dogg, entitled Get Jiggy With My Nine Home Slice. I told you you couldn't understand it. <clears throat> I was talking to a sibling. <laughs> this <laughs> this African American was telling me that, <laughs> that a business transaction involving pharmaceuticals went awry. <laughs> One of the participants apparently being underfinanced. Unable to raise the necessary capital, he decided to abscond with the products. Needless to say, the first party of siblings wants him to reconcile this debt. And I'm afraid to say that may include the use of firearms. <laughs> uh, thank you. Oh, you're very kind. And finally, from the late, great Mr. Easy e Two Hard Mothers. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Perhaps you're familiar with my work. I'm Easy e I shoot people and then leave promptly so as to avoid incarceration. <laughs> I see there are some women in the audience here tonight. You're probably thinking we'd enjoy having sex with Easy e Yes, yes you would. You see, I'm the type of African-American who was designed for durability. And if you disagree with me, I may lodge my foot in your rectum. <laughs> All right, that was... Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Are you horny now? I do that to get everybody very horny. I like the crowd to be horny. You know, my friend uh, Ann Coulter tells me all the time. Oh, I know, I know, I know, but she's very different when she's coming. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke, I'm kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you, but, uh, but she always uh, says liberals have joyless sex, and it reminds me that uh, in addition to a war on drugs that we never stopped after 9-11, we also still have a war on sex. Before he left office, Ashcroft passed down an in indictment against the porn industry. Uh, he named five videos. I'm going to tell you one of the titles, not because I want a cheap laugh, but because I want you to understand where your tax dollar is going. One of the titles was, A Thousand and One Ways to Eat My Jizz. Apparently, Ashcroft was okay with the first 999, but the last two just set him off. He was, that is no way to eat jizz. He, and, you know, believe it or not, here's something I have in common with John Ashcroft, which is that I don't really also have any desire to watch movies about people eating jizz. The difference is, I don't ask that you legislate my taste. I don't ask that my opinion be made into the law. You know, if it's your opinion that beer is a better drug than pot, well, you're wrong, but, you know, I respect that. I mean, I don't actually respect it, but I, I let you have it, it, whatever. If it's your opinion that having children is the greatest thing a person can do, God bless you, many people would agree with you, but it is still only an opinion, and there shouldn't be a prejudice against single people, and there certainly is in the workplace, single people know, when the family guy... When the family guy needs some time off, it's always, you know, go ahead, Bob. You got twins in the school play. What if I have twins in the jacuzzi? <laughs> huh? <laughs> but we do it all the time. We legislate taste. We do it with the tax code. Churches and children get a tax break because it's, all, it's assumed 
that we all agree that we want to encourage churches and children. I don't. I don't. That's my opinion. I don't want to encourage either churches or children, and it's a very bad idea to put them together. In fact, if I had to give one bit of advice to kids, I would say this. Kids, never have sex with a priest. No, I'm not kidding. Because when you have sex with a priest, you're not just having sex with that priest. You're having sex with every kid that priest had sex with for the last 10 years. And that could be a lot of kids because they transfer them from diocese to diocese. You don't know where these kids have been. I'm just saying. <laughs> when you send your kid to mass, put a condom in his pocket. Put a condom. Children's safety. That's what it's all about. Come on. Nothing's more important than children's safety. Got you there. <laughs> I'll tell you another way we legislate taste. Health matters. It was always my opinion that food, at least the food we eat in this country, was at least as bad for your health as smoking. And now the statistics pretty much back me up on that. But you know what? I took a lot of shit for that opinion. I used to get it from the Fat Acceptance Society. They said I was fattest. <laughs> they issued a fatwa on me. <laughs> they said I don't accept. Of course I, ac I accept everybody. I love people of girth. <laughs> I just remember when I used to be a smoker that there was just no end of the shit that you could give to smokers. You could sue them and shame them and punish them and overtax them and make them huddle in doorways like a hooker. <laughs> Even evil <laughs> MTV once a day just to show it's not all about the bling bling would have some public service announcement with some earnest 18-year-old kid standing in front of a tobacco company building going, they lied to us, man! And America would applaud. You know America loves to applaud bullshit. They lied to us. Of course they lied to you, fool. They're drug pushers. Tobacco companies are drug pushers. That's the given. Of course they're going to lie. The bigger lie was the one we told ourselves, that somehow we couldn't resist the tobacco companies. How, how are we to know it was bad for us? The cough? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that was the beginning of the moral rot which now, to my view, has <laughs> culminated in the gastric bypass operation. You know this, where people have their stomach stapled and then they take a big victory lap. Hey, you lost 150 pounds, how'd you do it? How'd he do it? They took out the organ that digests the food. <laughs> what do you mean, how did he do it? And you stuck with it, huh? <laughs> this is like, crazy gluing your nostrils shut to quit cocaine <laughs> and then getting a big pat on the back about it. You know, we uh, last year passed in our Congress this giant Medicare entitlement prescription drug bill because it's important to keep our seniors high. <laughs> and it's going to cost literally trillions and trillions of dollars. And while they were debating this, nobody ever stood up and said, excuse me, why are we so sick? Why do even older people need this amount of drugs? <laughs> Could it be because we eat like Caligula? You know, the top five of those prescription drugs that are so popular, they're all antacids, anti-bloating medicines, digestive aids, all things to put out the fire in our stomach from the poison that we call lunch. Folks, it's the food. I know people hate to hear that, but you know, when you look at those ads on the evening news at night, people farting and burping and bloating, it's all just shit trying to get out of you. Take a hint. It's the most... <laughs> that...
That, that evening news is the most depressing show on television. Not because of the news, it's those ads. Every ad is people I can't chew, I can't digest, I can't go to the bathroom, I can't stop going to the bathroom, I'm flatulent, I'm incontinent, I'm constipated, I can't get a heart on, I'm depressed. Oh Christ, you're depressed. I want to blow my brains out every night at seven o'clock. This disgusting litany of ugh. What if it kicks in on the bus? I don't want to think about it kicking in on the bus. Oh God. And those Cialis commercials have got to go. You know, Jesus. <laughs> Will you be ready? Oh, fuck you. Like American men don't have enough to stress about, will you be ready? What time did I take the boner pill? <laughs> Jesus. Was it the four hour one or the all day one or the six hour, what fucking? There's, there's one Cialis ad with a guy, <laughs> he comes into this party, he's got a glow about him, you know. He's just been to the doctor. You know, he hasn't even gotten laid yet. He just got the shit in his pocket, you know, and, and he comes into the party and all the heads turn, like in the 80s when the guy with the cocaine would show up. <laughs> but honestly, look at the burping and the farting and the bloating. It's the food. You're not going to die from secondhand smoke or SARS or monkey pox, it's the food. The call is coming from inside the house. I'm telling you. <laughs> the killer is not West Nile <laughs> or avian flu or shark attacks. It's the buffalo wings. It's the aspartame and the Nutrisweet and the red dye number two and the high fructose corn syrup and the MSG and the chlorine and whatever shit is in special sauce. It's the steroids, hormones, and antibiotics that are in the beef. I wouldn't touch a hot dog unless you put a condom on it. You realize that the job of a hot dog is to use parts of the animal that the Chinese can't figure out how to make into a belt? That... <laughs> you know, we feed cows too sick to stand to people too fat to walk. And then we wonder why these diseases spring up, mad cow and AIDS and Ebola. You know, nature, it doesn't ask a lot. It really doesn't. Don't ground up the cattle and feed them back to each other. And don't fuck the monkeys, you know? Not big requests. And don't be gluttons. Gluttons. I read that in 1950, the average American ate six pounds of cheese a year. Now it's 30. In 1900, the average woman's shoe size was four. In 1980, it was seven. Now it's nine. We are evolving into a completely new species with giant webbed feet to support our massive girth. Seating has had to be expanded everywhere in America in the last 10 years on buses and planes and stadiums, airport, everywhere. If you invested in any sort of ass widening technology in the 90s, you did very well. Hospital beds had to be made, but gurneys, wheelchairs, caskets were not ample enough, so the graveyards had to make the plots bigger. We don't even fit into the ground. <laughs> That's bad. And then what do they ban? Ephedra. <laughs> Which... <laughs> Which I'm sure is not good for you, but it is something that helps you lose weight. It just amused me that that's what they... It always amuses me when the government protects me. 
by banning something. Because you know what? The government, they really have my best interest at heart, especially when it comes to food and drugs. That's not about campaign contributions and money. No. Like with Canadian drugs, they're protecting us. You know, a lot of Americans would like to get prescription Canadian drugs because they're cheaper, but the government says, no, you can't. We don't know if they're safe. It's from Canada. <gasps> Yeah, right. I mean, I usually get dysentery when I go up there. It's, it's a lot like Haiti. Yeah, I mean, the thought of these <laughs> filthy native tribesmen in Toronto <laughs> brewing up batches of Zoloft <laughs> in their unclean cast iron pots. Thank you, government, for protecting me. But, uh, but Ephedra, that one surprised me. They must have missed a payment. Um, <laughs> cause, because ephedra is speed, and speed is America's drug. If that's your drug, you're so hooked up in America. No matter what form you take it in, Red Bull or Jolt or Viverin or Starbucks, if that is your drug, you are so set. It's every 10 feet, it's 24-7. McDonald's have it, the 7-Eleven has it, Barnes and Nobles has it, the gas station has it, the president has it before his morning jog. If that's your drug, you're set because speed is good for the prime directive, greed. Pot, no. Pot makes you eat macaroni out of a big green bowl. That's, that's not good for the prime directive. But speed is good for greed. Get the workers back to work. Get the coffee in them. Get the hamsters back on the wheel. I mean, America loves speed so much that we have deified NASCAR driving. You know, Dale Earnhardt died and Congress voted him a medal as a national hero. And I was like, where's my medal? For all the times I risked my life for a cheap thrill. N not that I'm against NASCAR, I'm not, please. I'm a libertarian, fellas, have at it. I hope every redneck in the world gets into an orange jumpsuit and has around the track. Enjoy! But could you spare me the bullshit that goes along with this sport? This crap about how we want to make it safer? No, you don't. If you made it safer, we would just be watching traffic. <laughs> Which is kind of what they're doing anyway. And then the way they're always shocked when one of the drivers dies, you know, ah, my God, one minute he was flying around an oil slick track <laughs> at 200 miles an hour, bobbing and weaving among other cars and then just gone. <laughs> just, yeah, I tell you, fate, huh? <laughs> Why, when the big guy wants to get you, he'll find you wherever you are. And then this is really stupid. Last year, Dale Earnhardt Jr. had an accident and people started talking about, maybe there's an Earnhardt curse. <laughs> you know, like these people are in the frozen yogurt industry and they keep bursting into flames. I'm telling you, this, this, this country is so cuckoo about safety. You know, we, <laughs> nobody can ever die. We will do everything we can to make sure that never happens. We buy SUVs, we strap ourselves in, we have head restraints and airbags and extra belts, and then we'll drive to an amusement park and pay a minimum wage carny to push us off a 10-story platform <laughs> in a padded shopping cart. <laughs> I, <laughs> Every accident that ever happens, no matter how freakish, people say, we have to make sure it never happens again. You know, th there was a, a tragedy that happened a couple of years ago in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. A 
it was, it was a tragedy. A Japanese fishing boat had the misfortune of being right under a surfacing American nuclear submarine. And it was a tragedy for the, for the fishing boat. Our, our guys were fine. They were like, what the hell was that? You know, they were... <laughs> and then, of course, there have to be all these commissions and court martials, and they brought the admiral up on charges, all to make sure it never happens again, as if it ever would. <laughs> have you ever been on the ocean? It's big. <laughs> Oh, it, it is virtually an ocean of water. It is. I mean, the... You know, I'm sorry. I'm not to be cruel, but if you're a Japanese fisherman and you wake up one day like every other day, and by noon you have a Los Angeles-class Trident submarine up your ass, it was just your day to die. I mean... I don't know what people don't get about dying and it's not the worst thing that could happen to you. But when they take it to stem cells, you know, when, that to me is just going way too far on the other side of the equation. Uh, to, to... <laughs> stem cells are not even cells. Being against stem cell research is very close to declaring that life begins when you're just thinking about fucking somebody. And it's a good example of how religion does infect policy. Because if you remember, in 2001, in August, George Bush, when he should have been thinking about bin Laden during that month, he had that big decision to make about stem cells. Remember that? So he went away to the ranch <laughs> to think for like a month. Oh, the red states were very impressed. That George Bush, he's down there thinking. He's a thinker. I love it when George Bush thinks he's punishing world leaders by not inviting them to the ranch. You know, like Jacques Chirac is just crestfallen that he won't be leaving the dreary Elysee Palace in Paris, France to go fart hot dogs and watch the Golf Channel in Crawford, Texas. <laughs> But yeah, he went down to the ranch to think about stem cells, and then he emerges, like a month later, with this King Solomon-like decision where he has split the difference. And the media hails as so wise, as if it is wise to split the difference between people who really could be helped and your right-wing nut base who would rather see research go undone, all because some microscopic goo on a subatomic level might, what, one day grow up to be a Republican? I don't know, I, I just, I, that I don't get. But you know, but you know, we're talking about a president who doesn't believe in evolution. Again, I'm not making this up, I'm not mocking him, I'm reporting. This guy says the, he says the jury's out. Jury's out, don't know, it's a theory. He says, well, that's a theory in creationism. Got two good theories. <laughs> I'm Swiss. I'm telling you, I am... Are you Swiss too? Are there a lot of Swiss people here? Because this is just... And I know people are saying, Bill, you're so mean, ridiculing religion. I am not ridiculing religion. It ridicules itself, okay? I'm not the one being hostile. I'll, I'll tell you what I think is hostile. What I think is hostile when so many people preface everything they say, as so many do nowadays, with, well, I'm a Christian. You know how people do that? You want fries with that? Well, I'm a Christian. You know, as if they have the moral high ground. Please, I'm a Christian, so I've got the high ground here. You know, they think that's what I'm hearing. They think I'm hearing I'm a better person. But really, what I'm hearing is you have a neurological disorder. <laughs> and... Same as, as when they say, Jesus is always with me. I'm hearing, okay, that's called having an imaginary friend. 
Which is okay when you're a child. When you're a child, it's okay to believe in myths and fairy tales to settle unque unsettling questions in your mind. But when you get older, you have to kind of look at it again. Yes, it's not your fault. I'm not being hostile. I'm trying to find a way to understand how otherwise bright people can, under can believe in stuff that is nonsensical and spiritually unnecessary. And the reason is because they did it to you when you were a kid. I also was raised Catholic. People, adults, they put stupid shit in kids' heads. They don't do it just mentally. They do it physically. When I was a kid, they drilled mercury into my cavities. Mercury, which we now avoid even in fish, even in trace amounts, and they drilled it right into my head. But when I got older, I had it drilled out, and you can do the same thing with Catholicism. <laughs> I personally have been uh, studying Kabbalah <laughs> in Us Magazine. <laughs> Apparently it's where they keep all the lore of that religion. Well, seriously, does anything make people do stupider things than religion? Uh, the Supreme Court this year heard the, the case about the Ten Commandments. This is my favorite of the last couple of years about religion. Because, you know, one of the Ten Commandments says, don't worship statues. So in Alabama, they made a statue of the Ten Commandments and worshiped it. Wow, that's powerful stupid. I mean, that is seriously powerful. And again, I'm not making it up. I'm just reporting. And of course, besides the fact that you shouldn't drag the Ten Commandments in front of your courthouse because it might show you're a little prejudicial to one religion, did anyone notice that among the Ten Commandments, hardly any of them are laws? If anything doesn't belong in front of a courthouse, it should be the Ten Commandments. They're not laws. Don't curse. Not a law. Honor your mom and dad. Not a law. Take Sunday off. Not a law. Don't fuck around on your wife. Not a law. Although you can get impeached for that one. <laughs> And don't worship statues, not a law. And also, obviously, not understood <laughs> in many parts of the country. <clears throat> now, only two of the commandments are laws. Don't steal and don't kill. Now, couldn't we all have just gotten together and agreed on that without all the bells and whistles? <laughs> couldn't, couldn't we have just gotten together and said, look, I won't slaughter you and don't take my shit. You know, I, no, I gotta get that from a burning bush. I gotta get that from a burning bush, unless I see that in a bush. It's just, you know, these are troubled times. We have to think our way out. We can't faith our way out. It's not a coincidence that so much of Bush's base or faith people, because Bush works in mysterious ways. <laughs> it helps to have faith. It really does. But religion, it stops people from thinking because they think all the answers are in that one book. It impre impedes progress. It, it justifies crazy people. Flying planes into a building was a faith-based initiative. It, and matters of otherwise common sense become points of debate. Like gay marriage, would we even be having this discussion about whether gay people can marry except for religion? Of course the Catholic Church doesn't want gay men to marry. Half the priesthood would walk out the door the first day and marry the UPS driver. It's because it says in the Bible, no queers. That's where the whole thing comes from, the Bible. The same book that says slavery is okay. 
and that you can stone someone to death for working on Sunday. That book, the one with the snake and the poison apple and the virgin birth and people lived in a whale and people lived to 900 years old, that infallible work of genius that the president believes literally. I'm telling you, sometimes this guy is so retarded he could be on death row in Texas. Well, uh, no. Okay, <laughs> that one was a little partisan. Okay, I'll give you that. And of course, what's so sad about it is that in this country, we really don't even have any party to represent us on this issue. The Democratic Party doesn't represent my views on this issue. The Democratic Party believes in civil unions. Why? Because they read the polls. And the polls say that Americans think that gay marriage threatens their marriage. Why? We don't know that yet. <laughs> Maybe because it looks more fun. So they don't represent my view, and neither do the Republicans, of course, because their base believes it's an abomination. They actually believe that gay marriage will lead to more homosexuality. Because a lot of guys, probably like me, were just looking for a little legal cover. <laughs> yeah, there'd be all sorts of man-on-man -man giant blowjobs breaking out in sports bars, except for the law. It's the law that's holding us back. So in the interest of taking this issue off the table, I have suggested in the past a few compromises, because you know, this country was built on compromises, really stupid compromises. For example, in the Constitution, black people are three-fifths of a person. Wow, that's really a stupid compromise. And it goes on today, medical marijuana. In most states where the, where the voters have passed the right to have medical marijuana, the feds don't recognize that. So it is legal to possess it, but not to obtain it. <laughs> you can have it, you just can't get it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's illegal for a doctor to write a prescription. You can't transport it, you can't buy it, you can't sell it. But if some of it falls out of the sky and into your mouth, you spark up that chronic, that is all you. So. <laughs> so how about this? If you're gay already, okay, but no new gays. Huh? We grandfather you in <laughs> if you're already gay, but that's it. Or, we allow gay marriage, but no gay mortgage. <laughs> or, since half the people want it and half the people don't, how about we just let the lesbians marry? <laughs> marriage is kind of a chick thing anyway. <laughs> I mean, come on. Men don't want to do it. Straight, gay, they don't, you know. This is something cooked up by women in the Catholic Church to stamp out oral sex. It's, you know, plus, you know, when the right wing talks about it's an abomination, they're not talking about the chicks. You know, man sex, that's an abomination. It's the man sex, that's disgusting, you know. And not like sushi disgusting where you get used to it after a while. I mean, just like <laughs> disgusting, disgusting, disgusting. And you know what, I agree. Once again, here's some place I agree with the right wing because I am also completely revolted by the thought of hairy man ass sex. But again, the difference is I don't ask that my opinion be made into the law, okay? And I, and I have to tell you, I think I relate to this issue so much because of marijuana, because I, I am a pot smoker. I know I hide it well. Uh, but. You know, what the Democrats are saying to the gay people sounds so much like what people have always said to me about marijuana, which is, Bill, what do you care so much if marijuana is legal or not? You can always go outside the restaurant after dinner and smoke your pot in the alley. I've seen you do it a hundred times. <laughs> and that's like what the Democrats are saying. What do you care if we call it civil unions? You get most of the same benefits. And my answer to both is, fuck you. 
fuck you. You go outside after dinner and drink your brandy in the alley. You call whatever's going on under your roof a civil union. Either we're all drinking from the same water fountain in this country or we're not. Now, some people are just born 100% will and grace, over the rainbow, pottery barn, fire island gay. And they don't need reprogramming. They need a man with a slow hand. I... <laughs> I just think it is ridiculous that gay people should have to interrupt their lives to fight this battle, especially at a time when we're supposed to be teaching the world a lesson about freedom. Remember that? The hate is for our freedom. The hate is for our freedom. What happened to that? The hate is for our freedom. Hey, you know what my message is to the terrorists? Hate the Dutch, okay? I've been to Amsterdam. If freedom is what really bugs you so much, go scare the shit out of those pot-smoking, whoremongering motherfuckers and leave us Swiss people alone. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You're a wonderful crowd. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you.